thank you all for coming out tonight for our, the second Thursday forum. We're so happy that you're here. Great audience, also a virtual audience um, on Zoom tonight. I'm Wendy Ron. I am the, the person behind all the listserv emails, in case you haven't met me. Uh, and I am on the board of the St. Anthony Park Branch Library Association, or SAPLA, as we affectionately call ourselves. Now, SAPLA itself is an independent, it's independent of the library, it's its own 501c3, and we were founded actually 90 years ago, if you can believe it. So we are, we are celebrating our 90th anniversary uh, as an organization. And our mission is to support the programs and facilities of this lovely branch library we have in our neighborhood through the granting that we do, and we also um, aim to encourage the involvement of the community in the library itself. We work closely with library staff, including the fabulous, fantastic Alyssa Mee, without whose help we would not have a forum. And uh, uh, Alisa has just ordered a new book, actually, relevant to tonight's uh, conversation. It, it is by a, a, a local author, uh, Dr. Heidi Coop, Roop, right. Um, and it's called The Climate Action Handbook, 100 Things That You Can Do. So that will be arriving soon to our local library. We also work with other community organizations, including the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, who's here tonight making this recording for us, which we will um, have available on our website. The new website should be launching very, very soon. I will send out an announcement um, about that. And we are also cooperating tonight with Transition Town All St. Anthony Park, who is co-sponsoring tonight's event with us. Um, if you'll indulge me a little bit, I just want to describe some of the things that we do um, at SAPLA. Uh, most of you probably don't realize, but SAPLA is the umbrella organization um, that, that sponsors um, the beloved art fair that we have here um, in June. So we are the umbrella organization behind all those efforts. Uh, during the book, uh, art fair, we host a book sale in uh, the library auditorium and the, that, that's our major fundraising event and then all the proceeds of that book sale then return um, to the library in the form of our grants. We also work on facilities here. We provide money, funding for various facility upgrades. We work with the uh, St. Anthony Park Garden Club on our beautiful gardens um, out front there. And of course, we help fund programming and activities, and in, including many of our beloved children's programs that are offered here at the library. This, the Thursday Forum is a new thing for us. It was inaugurated in September with a forum of the St. Paul School Board candidates. And so we had some wonderful forums last, uh, last year. It, it is now 2024. And perhaps some of you attended our lively and fun holiday sing-along with Dan Chenard uh, last month. Coming up in February, we will have a Thursday forum with, with Dr. Benjamin Rosenstein, who is a, a geriatrician and a professor at the U of M. And he'll be talking about some of the things that we may, need to be thinking about for ourselves or for our aging parents um, when you're considering long-term care. There are many things to keep in mind and some of these decisions are better made before a crisis point uh, hits. In March, March 14th is Pi Day, and guess what? We're celebrating Pi Day here at the March Thursday Forum with actual pie, which I'm sure is an essential ingredient of a long and happy life. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for more information about that. In April, uh, we, hope you, we help you gear up for um, gardening season um, with Organic Bob, who will tell us how to turn our lawns into gardens by using alternative kinds of turf and plants friendly to pollinators. There will also be a workshop um, on the Saturday after the forum, um, so you can get your hands dirty there. And in May, we finish out our inaugural season with local author Mia uh, Nosenau, whom many of you might know. Mia is about to publish a book, and it's called The College Student's Guide to Mental Health. Uh, Mia is a mental health counselor who specializes in college students, and she worked at McAllister College for 20 years. Um, and she distills her wisdom over her career into her new book. And then finally, in June, we bring back our 
uh, lovely arts fest. This is a major labor of love, and we hope that we can get you to participate in Arts Fest. Um, Arts Fest, the Arts Fest itself is um, directed by the wonderful Anna G, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name. And um, she owns the makery here in Milton Square. All right, before I introduce then tonight's panel, there's some matters of housekeeping that I want to go over. Uh, first, the library closes at 8 o'clock, and so we absolutely need you out the door at the end of the panel, which is 7.30. Because, as you can see, we need to do a lot of takedown before the library closes. But on your way out, we invite you to come over to Nico's across the street. Uh, Nico's has generously donated their back room to us tonight for continuing conversation. So don't wait for us to arrive there to order a drink or some food. We will be arriving probably shortly after 8. Um, and then uh, finally, you, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer, but we ask that you uh, write your question down on some index cards that'll be passed around. Then those will be forwarded to me up here, and I'll actually read your questions. And this is so that the Zoom audience actually will be able to hear the questions asked. Um, all right. Now on to the main event. Um, we are very pleased to have with us tonight um, a, a panel, uh, panel to offer you some practical advice on how you as a homeowner can tackle the climate crisis, crisis in your own backyard, so to speak. Um, Terry Olson, local architect and homeowner. Marty Ruddy, who is a co-founder of the construction firm Terra Firma and has been a great friend to the library itself as well as to other um, community organizations in the neighborhood. And then we have Tim Wooling, uh, who is the home energy lead at Transition Town ASAP. We're going to give each of the panelists a couple minutes to uh, introduce themselves and then we'll turn it over for their individual remarks followed by question and answer. So thank you very much again for being here tonight, um, and we look forward to talking with you later after. Good afternoon, good evening, you can hear me? Um, I'm Terry Olson, I am an architect. I have been working in the profession since 1989. I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but this is a passion of mine. I absolutely love sustainable design, and I'm an architect in the American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment. I've been doing that since 2003. I am a U.S. Green Building Council lead um, professional, and I work extensively, both um, commercially and in my own house, in doing the things that I'm going to give you some low-tech and high-tech. So not everything has to toss, cost a lot of money, but we'll uh, find some options that maybe you can take home when you get uh, uh, done from, the, from this today. Uh, I'm Marty, and um, as mentioned, I work for Terra Firma. Uh, we have worked on uh, thousands of homes in the Twin Cities, and including many of the homes of people that are here. Um, hi. And... Uh, <laughs> Our, our firm has evolved, I think, with the interests of the community um, in green building practices. Uh, we, are, we have several people in our firm that are Passive House certified. Um, we mostly do renovations, but we do build about one new home a year. We collaborate mostly with architects. I can talk a little bit about that process tonight. Um, I think it's a it's a big complicated puzzle as to how to go about home improvement and thinking about like how much energy we're putting into the renovation uh, and the materials that are going in there. Um, it takes time to have that conversation, but I really look forward to your specific questions, recognizing that every home really probably that you live is totally unique. There's not another one like it. Um, in the community and uh, the projects that you want to do are unique and um, your questions are probably unique too so I look forward to hearing what you have to say well I first got interested in uh, home energy I guess in the 1970s during the oil crisis and I started reading about people doing super insulation of their houses um, 
my background is in engineering and I like working the numbers, but my work was not in uh, buildings or building science, but I've um, in retirement taken some online courses, attended some conferences and lots of webinars. Uh, so I, I was a, one of the founders of Transition Town All St. Anthony Park in 2009 and uh, have taken the lead on the home energy group within Transition Town. Uh, a year ago, we had a group meeting quite regularly looking at how do we electrify our homes. That has kind of uh, stalled, but um, we're needing to look at how to make the transition from talking about it to doing something. And I guess uh, I'd be interested in knowing of anyone who wants to take that route. We have a sign-up sheet on the Transition Town table, so uh, indicate that, if you will, and you can see what might develop. So, so all right, well, I wanted to just maybe um, open the, the slides. Sure. <coughs> so I've got some show and tell. So everybody thinks of, of solar panels, and solar panels are sexy. But before you even do the solar panels, you want to... Um, you want to actually reduce your energy consumption. So the first thing you want to do is actually look at either adding insulation, and there's all sorts of other things you can do as well. Um, adding weather stripping. Um, a lot of times people will, I've seen little uh, plush dogs or things put against their, the sill of their, do their doors, but if you also weather strip on the inside of the doorway between the screen and the we're having some technical difficulty, but I will keep. Um, so the weather stripping is very important, but mm. there's something that you can do that maybe you didn't realize. It's called a mirror. And if you go around your foundation, and if you've got where your foundation wall gets overlapped by your siding, it looks like everything is sealed up tight, but then you go and you look underneath, and you will find that the things that we can't see the little bugs, and air is getting through, moisture is getting through, mice can get through. So you can actually find where you add weather um, caulking and, and go around your house. This is a great thing to do every year just because um, your, your materials expand and contract over time. Another thing that you might want to do, especially this weekend, you're going to find that when it's sub-zero, you're going to really be able to tell wherever you've got an outlet use one of these little guys if you put your hand in front of the outlet you'll be able to find airs coming in you may not notice so so much um yeah we can scroll to the next there's two things i'm talking about for decarbonization is the energy efficiency and um and then electrification but so i just mentioned the trick on the on the mirror and then we've got the the child proof outlets so you'll be able to find when that air is coming in, this does make a difference. Two bucks, hardware store, you can do that this weekend and you've already started um, helping weatherize your house. Um, another thing that we can do, it's not just the winter time, but also the summertime. We want to have um, shade helps reduce your, your energy consumption. So if you have a tree, water it, love your tree. If you don't have a tree and you can plant a tree, plant a tree. And then ceiling fans are a great opportunity as well to, it helps de-stratify your house. So you are able to get your, your air to flow and um, not have your heat all up by the ceiling. And then it, um, you can also reverse your fan blades, the direction, so that in the wintertime it pushes the heat down. And then in addition to thermal, um, you also have heat generated by your incandescent light fixtures and I'm assuming that I'm talking to a group that already knows what these are this little LED and there's a whole different there's bunches of different types I was an early adopter back in 2005 they look like this and they they were really blue and a lot of people are like oh I don't like LEDs they're so blue well they are now color rectified and it's what's there's a a kelvin temperature so you can go everything from the 
the cool, um, the cool um, blue tones to a warm white. And I think we have the next slide will show. So that shows a couple of different options with the weather sealing. It shows that little um, outlet, what you can put in your outlets. And it also shows your daylighting. Um, the cool is 6,500 um, Kelvin. And it's a temperature, but it's, it's a color temperature, not the heat temperature. All the way to a warm white is 2,700. So if you hear somebody say, oh, I don't like LEDs because they're so blue, um, you can actually get ones that, that mimic whatever type of lighting you want, more natural light. Um, another thing is people would say, oh, I want a 40-watt light bulb or a 100-watt light bulb. Well, you're no longer using 40 watts or 100 watts. And you can go by the brightness is based on lumens. And, um, but you don't have to do that because, as Tim had pointed out to me earlier, a lot of the light fixture uh, light bulbs will already say like 40 watt equivalent so that you can kind of make that comparison. Next slide. So in addition to energy conservation, there's electrification. And so we talked about solar panels as one thing that um, everybody seems to want to do. That's, that's a great thing. But again, we want to reduce our consumption first. And so if you look at a heat pump, if you look at your refrigerator, what it does is it takes the heat out of the objects in your refrigerator and pushes that heat out into your room. A heat pump does that, but it can do it bidirectionally. So it can take the heat out of the air, and you actually still have heat in the air even when it's negative, you know, negative 30 degrees, up until absolute zero, which is like minus 273, I think it is. You still have heat in the air. And so the heat pump can take heat out of the air and then um, and use, make it usable and just move it. So what I've got in my house is I replace my gas appliances, my um, gas dryer, my gas water heater and my gas stove. I have a heat pump dryer, I have a heat pump water heater, and I have an induction cooktop with a convection oven. And we can maybe just go to the next slide for some show and tell. So there's low tech and high tech there. So I'm showing both the water heater, the dryer, and also just a clothesline. A solar dryer is what we would call it, where you put your clothesline out and you catch the sun. You know, you can also have the, your line in the inside as well. But with the, um, the heat pump dryer, it might take a little bit longer, but it's really good for the environment. And you're not actually burning any fossil fuels. I was also able to close up the wall that where I had a, a ducted vent. I don't need that anymore. So I no longer have that more that hole in the wall. Let's go to the next slide. Induction cooktop, that is amazing. I can't tell you how fast that is. But you're going to need something that's magnetic because it operates based on a um, magnet magnetism. So you'll take either stainless steel, not all stainless steel, but some sort of stainless or uh, some sort of steel or a cast iron. You can just mm -hmm. use a magnet. If it sticks, it'll work. So um, if you're going shopping or um, you want to test what you've got at home to see if it'll work, just use your a simple refrigerator magnet. Um, and then back to there's high tech and there's low tech. Something as simple as I have right here is a solar oven. I put food in it, put it in the sun. Four hours later, I've got dinner or I've got lunch. It's, there's no electricity use. I've just also reduced the heat in my house. When it's 90 degrees outside, I don't have to um, heat up my kitchen. And I think that might be, oh, and I'm on the journey just as all of you are. I am not 100% where I want to be. I still have a furnace. It's 21 years old. I'm hoping it makes it through another year, but I'm investigating different options for heat pump for my house for uh, replacing my furnace. And um, there's a lot of, a lot of the country's already been using this. And now they have what's called cold climate heat pumps. And those are what we would use in our area here. Um, and there are rebates, but I will let Tim talk to more of that. And 
Um, I'm interested to hear what you guys are doing and I'm um, looking forward to questions as well. I'll be more general, so I'll, I'll go and then you can get into construction. Okay. I don't know if there's a sequence to our presentations, but we'll see. <laughs> the um, most important thing, in my opinion, is that we need to reduce energy use. We talk about net zero energy and so on, but uh, net zero can still be high energy. We want to reduce energy and net zero. So, um, and a couple of things about the larger picture. I think we should think of our homes as not just our own, but also they belong to St. Paul. St. Paul has a uh, carbon plan, and in order to succeed, it needs all of us. And so we're in this together. Our individual actions matter, but it's not just um, how much money does it save me, but how really does it help us deal with the climate problem? Um, the, another thing to keep in mind is uh, the electric grid. As we get rid of central power plants, we're relying more on renewable energy. And renewable energy depends on the sun and the wind, and so we will need to be flexible in how, when we draw from the grid. Now, one example of that would be a water heater. If you have a tank water heater, uh, the new ones come with a communications port that Excel will be developing programs to connect to, and um, it then can avoid heating that water during, say, a hot summer afternoon when there's peak load on the grid. And so that kind of interaction doesn't affect when the water is available, but it certainly is a way we can all work together on a more interactive grid. Incidentally, Excel offers a $25 credit per month if you let them control your water heater like that. The doing these things is expensive. There have been a lots of financial incentives available, and now with the Inflation Reduction Act, we hear a lot more. And on the table back there, we have some uh, boxes that represent different uh, finance programs, uh, rebate options, and so on. You can look at the boxes and stack them up and find out how you can piece these things together to help uh, offset the cost of whatever project you have. So some of these. First of all, XL Energy has rebates for uh, different appliances and things. They are in sort of the hundreds of dollars. They aren't huge, but they help. And um, if you're anyone who's on energy assistance can sign up for the weatherization assistance program. And for that, uh, there, up to $8,000 of work can be done in your house without any charge to you. So if you know anybody who's on energy assistance or would qualify for energy assistance, um, let them know about this. Um, in the IRA, which is the new legislation we hear about, there are... Uh, income tax credits. And credits are good up to 30% with some maximum amount for different kinds of projects. There's a whole list. It's not straightforward and simple, but there's a list. Uh, and that's good for people with high enough incomes to have enough tax to get the full credit. The One of the genius things, I think, about the Inflation Reduction Act is that it, it recognizes that low-income people don't benefit from the tax credit, and therefore there's a rebate program based on income. For low-income, rebates are available. Nonprofits don't get an advantage from a tax credit, and so there's a mechanism which 
I haven't looked into, but some mechanism by which the nonprofit can gain the effect of the tax credit. And so be, be aware of that, especially with any organization you might be involved with. The rebates for low-income people can add up to as much as $14,000. That can do quite a lot in a project. And uh, anyone doing home energy reductions where you reduce the energy use of your home by 20% or 35% or more gets a certain amount of uh, $4,000 credit, $8,000. It depends on income level uh, and how much um, reduction you have in energy use. But uh, that's a significant feature. These, these two, these rebate programs, however, are, are, are federal money that's allocated to the state, and Minnesota then has the responsibility of figuring out the ways to distribute those rebates. And Minnesota is still figuring that out. So as yet, they aren't available, mm -hmm. but uh, they should be this year. Uh, and so uh, take that into account in your projects. There's also a low interest loan fund uh, available through federal funding, and they're kind of mysterious. I couldn't find much more about it beyond their acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> so ideally, contractors will learn about these rebates and know how to work through them for the kind of work that they are doing. In the meantime, we're all on a learning curve. <laughs> Am I, uh, there's a little ring there. Okay, well, uh, that's awesome. Thanks, Tim. Um, I guess I'll start out first as uh, it's, it's a lot of careful planning for us. So we're, we are a general contractor. Um, and so uh, most of the projects that we're involved with um, have a lot of different components to them. And, and as, even though we think about your house as... Um, a whole, it's that we actually break it down into all the smallest components we possibly can. Um, and that's kind of where this conversation comes in is that we want to look at what are all the possible opportunities that we have to improve the efficiency of your home? What opportunities do you have to improve the efficiency of your home? And to start that conversation early. Uh, in the process is important. Most of the time, most of the projects that we're involved with, there are really m multiple stakeholders. Um, there's there's the client, and we almost always have an architect involved. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation about what the assemblies are going to look like. And it's really important, I think, for you as clients to really advocate for what your priorities and goals are. Um, you might come to the table with, hey, it's really important that energy efficiency is really in the forefront of this conversation. Uh, but there could be, uh, it could be an opportunity there that either your builder is uncomfortable with or it's sometimes what we see oftentimes is the architect's not willing to go for the assembly that we want. Not to throw that bus or anything like that. But there, it, it's a love-hate thing here. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Point being is that is advocate for what your goals are, um, and there there's uh, budget considerations, uh, there's schedule considerations, there's lead times. All those things have to be talked about, and it might be like, hey, we can't do it exactly the way we want to because of some other factors and all the considerations. But let's at least look at them. For instance, you know, triple pane windows are a wonderful option, but they really reduce the light transmission. And some people might be like, hey, I don't know that I really want to do that here. This is this exposure and this light is super important here. So it, it might not always be the best fit in every elevation. So it might be in certain elevations, you know, on the east side or the north side, we're going to go for those triple glaze, but maybe in another area we won't. So each, it just kind of keeps coming back to that each 
project is unique, each house is unique. We also want to really recognize that, um, is that my timer? Am I up? Because uh, that'll go on for a while. Um, we really, my time's up. we want to think about this. We want to encourage our clients to think about this is that um, not only are you our client, one of the stakeholders, but also the, the local community as well. So we're going to think about, you know, what does the grading look like? Where is the water? Can we keep the water on site? Um, uh, where are the downspouts located? Well, a, a whole bunch of different aspects of, of how, you know, your your house is going to impact the community. But then also there's the global community and where is where are the materials being sourced? And so ask those questions as well when you're having conversations with your contractor. And, you know, are they are there opportunities to do local resources as opposed to, you know, Ipe decking is super popular, but it comes from the rainforest. And so can we look at a thermally modified ash that's that's more local and it's it's, you know, robust and and uh, and durable? So. A lot of different product options that are out there more than ever, more than I know about. I mean, many clients come to me and say, hey, here's this great product, and that's where I learn about it. Um, so uh, a bunch of different parts of your house. Energy audits are easy to get done. Blower door tests, you know, they were that blower door was invented in, in Minneapolis. It used to be, I think it used to be called the Minneapolis blower door, and now, now it's just the blower door. But... It's a very easy test to get done, and that will identify where your air leakage is, and, and the person doing the test will, there's different kind of levels to it, but they can bring in an infrared camera, and that'll really help you identify where that's happening. What's a blower door? What's a blower door? It's a, um, it's a door that gets put uh, on your exterior door, and then it's got a fan on it, and it puts your house at a certain pressure, and then we can see it, uh, where the air is is moving to and where it's coming out and there's different techniques one is with the infrared camera not, we, we can actually test how leaky your house is so we can actually see where is it and then after the air seal is done we can test it again and say how much did we move the metric on that and they're really easy to do and so it's a it's a very basic measuring tool there are certain seasons that you have to do them in like uh, if it's if there's not a different temperature between the inside of your house and the outside, then it's very difficult to, um, to get it because the infrared camera doesn't work as well. Um, so this is the time to do it. <laughs> this is a great, this is a great time to do it. Yep, yeah, it is. It is. Um, so blower door tests, I, I'm always amazed too, when I go in people's basements and the rims, uh, aren't sealed up. Like there's a ton of, it's real low hanging fruit and that's a inexpensive, um, thing to do in your house. Uh, so I'd say air sealing is kind of one of the most basic thing. Apply, a lot of appliances too. Ask a lot of questions about performance ratings when you're getting your appliances and your HVAC equipment updated because it's amazing. Um, all of us contractors kind of want to do the easiest route forward. I mean, there, there is that, right? Like, hey, this is what we're familiar, this is what we know. But, but um, I think most people are willing to grow and learn and try new things. And that's kind of what's needed right now. So I think advocate for that as you're talking to your contractors about, hey, what is the rating? What are the what's the best rating that's out there? Like where is what what you're being offered in in terms of what else is is an option? Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Marty, uh, to what extent uh, can you encourage the homeowner to take on energy improvements? Are, are, do people listen if you offer suggestions? Before Marty responds, yeah, oh. um, this would be a great time to hand out those cards for your questions. And while you're writing your questions, we'll let the panelists ask each other questions. Um, so if you have a question for the panelists, please write legibly <laughs> so that I can read it. And, and, and then we'll take your questions um, in a couple minutes. So you guys go ahead. Uh, so if I understand the question, it's uh, are, are people willing to take the suggestions or do you mean uh, are, or, or, or well, both? Do, do you yeah. offer suggestions for mm -hmm. energy considerations and yeah. do people listen and act on it? I, it's a mixed bag uh, for sure. You know, I mean, I've had clients I'd say, hey, we really should upgrade the insulation in your attic. And they're like, don't worry about it. I'll just wear a sweater. 
Um, so we get that, and those are my clients, and we they're wonderful people, and but that's not where their priority is. So I think we, you know, everybody in this room, you're here because you're interested in doing it, and so, um, yeah, I'll, I'm not going to call you out. Um, so uh, it's a it's a great it's a great question. I mean, a budget is a huge thing, and I think that we we as much as possible, and I think most really good builders so not just terra firma but are going to go in and say hey here's some assemblies that we're suggesting that could be important um if you when the architects involved we're also recognizing hey there's really a design consideration going here and some of the improvements that we might be suggesting are going to have a different look um you know it's tough too like uh you get a big beautiful french range that's got six burners on it and it needs a huge commercial hood on it. It's the most energy inefficient thing you could possibly do, but it might be hard to talk that them out of that French range, right? And uh, so that's there to say, hey, we really should look at a smaller hood, but uh, that might not be able to bend on that, but they might be able to put in all triple glaze windows. And so there's, there's, some, there's some priorities. Everybody's got different priorities and um, we talk about those, and it's a fascinating discussion. It, it, it really is. So um, we've got to learn to get along with everybody's different values. Right. Yeah. I would love to talk them out of the, the French range if they've ever done induction cooking. It yeah, is amazing great. how fast it is. You can boil water like like nobody's mm -hmm. business, and you'll have pasta done before, you know. They've done com competitions where they have two chefs one's got a gas stove and one's got the the induction cooked up and and the person is done has the meal all set and, and the other guy is still waiting for the water to boil yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's amazing <laughs> and with that in mind i think uh with all the electrification of your homes as, as the appliances are going to that um as your your furnaces are going to go to electric furnaces and your boilers are going to go to electric boilers um, you know, your 100 amp service is just not going to be enough. And so you really do need to keep in mind that you're going to need 200 and really like anything we do now, it's a 400 amp service. So hard, hard, I know it's crazy, but that is, um, you know, with, with the loads of these, these appliances that they, they do take more, um, more energy and with the codes. So it's not just that, but the codes require separate breakers. And that is going to mean, um, that, that we need to up the, you're going to need to up the service. Um, yet, um, there are some references that are listed on the table back there that, uh, uh talk about a watt diet for your house. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. How, how if you do have a 100 amp service, you can squeeze more into it uh, than yeah. f first appears. And so yeah. don't, um, if you're in that state, uh, consider possibilities like that. You can reduce a lot just by going with LEDs. That'll reduce your consumption right off the bat. Yeah. Well, I think I'll give some questions to you guys from our audience. Got some great questions here. So um, first one. Uh, we are planning a 70 square foot ADU using a heat pump for heating and cooling. Uh, would supplemental heat be needed for temps below zero? That might be one for Tim. Or I, I could take a stab at it. Um, we'll compare our answers. Yeah, it's going to be great. So there's, there's probably some... Uh, code questions to get involved with. Certainly for your primary home, uh, a heat pump won't meet code currently in St. Paul, so you'll get pushback there. Um, and we're doing it at a garage right now where uh, it's insulated. It's, it's, I don't think it's officially an ADU, but um, there's a heat pump there, and I think it's rated for like negative 35 um and we are putting in at the request of the homeowners and the uh, heating contractor uh supplemental baseboard heat the, we, we've got a lot of great questions here so um well, I, just, I would encourage no i'll okay. let you finish i just would encourage everyone whose question we don't get to to come over to nico's <laughs> when, yeah. when you leave and we can uh um, get some of those answered sorry to interrupt but well, I don't know about code. I haven't dealt with that, and you certainly have. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, heat pumps can be designed 
for uh, winter temperatures, and it's important that the contractor do a load calculation on your house. What is the heating load? How much heat is lost on that cold day, minus 15 degrees? And heat pump can be sized for that, but uh, it takes careful planning. And of course, people don't have a lot of common experience as a community, and so we're nervous about that, but it can be done. I'd like to maybe address one other type of heat pump, which has been around for a long time. It's called geothermal or ground source heat pump. Your, your ground is 55 degrees all year round, and you can use it for both heating and cooling. It's, you know, that's even more efficient if you can get it to work in your, your site. That takes care of one question we got already. <laughs> so fabulous. Um, all right, so this is maybe for Tim. Uh, what is the best source to get understandable information on what the requirements are for IRA programs? Um. <laughs> Simple answer is complicated. Um, Rewiring America, I don't think this answers the question, has a a web page which says calculate your your benefit but all they do is give you a a sum of money that that your income level qualifies for uh, it doesn't tell how to get it and whether process are going about it so uh, I'm not sure yet <laughs> I think all of that's hopefully evolving. we'll get I mean because it's just rolling out now so more information I hope will be coming online um, Oh, so many good questions. Okay, uh, maybe this one um, is for Marty. I've worried that sealing my house up will create moisture and mold problems. Is this ever the case? And if so, how to avoid it? Um, I think that's, uh, that's uh, you know, in general, just not, not true. Um, but there are some instances right where where there could be a condition uh where the moisture can't get out um but i think in general the the idea is that when you're sealing it up on the inside you're reducing the amount of warm air that could condense on those cold surfaces in the wall cavity so it's it's really if anything you're you're uh you're going to reduce the amount of moisture. Um, but anyways, we, we lo certainly look at wall assemblies. There could be some condition that exists in your house that somehow the ceiling in a certain area uh, doesn't work. You know, nowadays when we assemble exterior walls, we put a drainage plane and, a, and oftentimes now we're putting an, even a, uh, uh, an air, basically an airplane, um, an air well for sure an air barrier but we're even putting in a, a space that's beyond a drain where air can travel outside of the air barrier so um in general air sealing is one of the best things you can do in your house to actually reduce the potential for mold to, and and moisture to happen in the in the wall cavities and the ceiling cavities or roof or roof cavities and you'll also be adding ventilation and so you'll want to like a heat recovery ventilation just because you're going to want fresh air in and you know exhausting out so that's also with passive yeah. house that's part of the requirement as well this is for you terry um i would like to do everything <laughs> attic basement walls but it costs too much should i make a 10-year plan absolutely um that's what i was doing you, you you have to prioritize you have to budget and it's every house is a little different so um what i did i I had a one and a half story Cape Cod and my roof, my shingles started falling off. And so I found that I had to replace the roof, but I, I didn't want to go shingles, so I went with metal. As long as I was going metal, I wanted to put solar panels, but then I had to rotate my roof because it was facing east and west. Well, as long as I had to replace the roof and the structure, I might as well lift it up, get a full second story out of it. <laughs> you know, and that's a snowball effect. But yes, and then I super insulated the walls, so I have super insulated um, and, and our 25 walls, our 50 or our 40 <laughs> roof, and now my upstairs is so quiet and so, you know, and it's, I've got huge windows that allow a lot of daylight in. It's just, it's fabulous. But 
it was, it started because my shingles were falling off. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, I, right? I second your comment <laughs> to have a plan. And, uh, and the first step of a plan, I think, is to take an inventory of what appliances you have, when will they die, and plan to do something before the end of their expected lifetime. And uh, that's the first step that I've put on the chart back there of six steps for electrifying a house. Oh, I'll, I'll second that. We actually had all three of our 20 plus year appliances fail at once. So now we have an induction stove, a new much more efficient refrigerator and a, and a dishwasher. So we had to do it all at once, but you can certainly do it one at a time as well. They don't make things to last as long as they used to though. I'm still impressed that we got more than 20 years out of our old one. Oh, okay, Tim, quiz. What are the acronyms for the low interest loans? <laughs> GGRF. EERLF. Oh. <laughs> uh, GGRF is Greenhouse Gas Revolving Fund. EERLF is Energy Efficiency L. Something. <laughs> Revolving Fund. L stands for something, or, or, or our yeah, revolving loan fund, RLF, okay. right. Oh my gosh, a prodigy. Yeah, Woo. This is good. <laughs> okay, this might stump the entire panel, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why do we use the British thermal unit instead of the less stuffy Italian unit? What is a BTU? <laughs> it's a British thermal unit, and it's, um, is it 10,000? It's based, one British thermal unit is based on the candle flame. Mm. And so then it, it goes from there. So. But why do we use it instead of something that, like some other system? And why does the... Because uh, we were a former British colony? Why does, why does XL Energy charge us for gas in terms of therms and not BTUs? Mm. It's 100,000. Uh, uh, BTUs would be too big a number. <laughs> oh well, speaking of Excel Energy, do any of the panelists use Excel's Energy wind source program? If not, it forces Excel to offset a customer's existing power usage with wind-generated power. I, I actually um, subscribe. I have solar panels on my house, but my backup energy for nighttime and when I'm not generating, is um, the wind source. However, wind source has now changed to now because they've got so many solar hmm. fields, it's both wind and solar. And, so, and good to, if you can get on it, it's good to. Right. So and it, isn't it also, all, also, name has changed to Renewable Connect? Yeah. <clears throat> all right, so um, question for Marty. What are assemblies? <laughs> oh yeah, um, that's a great question. Yeah, so yeah, we think of the assembly as uh, from the siding to the drywall. So the outside, uh, that that would be a, the wall assembly, and so that's kind of where your performance is going to come in in your house. Um, same thing with the roof assembly. There's different ways to. There's all these different ways that we can insulate it. I mean, a big thing that that is is happening in the construction industry is instead of the insulation just being inside of the cavity between the studs and the siding and the drywall we're trying to put the insulation on the outside because essentially there's no insulation between every stud if we do it the traditional way and that's every you know most of the time that's every 16 inches although we are going towards a more advanced framing method of every 24 inches um, so that's another thing you can ask for is the advanced framing method in your projects um, but if we can move that insulation to the outside as much as possible and there is kind of a formula sometimes where we we split it um, but there's some consideration too as to uh, not over over overloading it on one side or the other because it can kind of do the dew points can create connotation issues so um anyways that's that's an example of an assembly is is how those are constructed and that's all about performance i mean that's that's the whole that's the whole thing right there 
In architecture, we call that continuous insulation. So each of your studs, it's more um, relevant, I think, in commercial institutions where we've got, we use metal studs, and it's called a thermal bridge. So that cold radiates right into your house. Uh, wood isn't quite as much of a conductor, it's more of an insulator, but we want that insulation continuous beyond the face of that stud. And then, as Marty said, we can bring some of that insulation in, but you have to wear, watch where the dew point is, where that hits 32 degrees in that wall section. Um, but that's a calculation that gets done by your, your professionals. All right, this is a multi-part question, or it's actually three questions, so it, it might have to be our, our last postcard. Um, so I'll take them one at a time. Uh, is the credit that is possible for water heaters due to this connection Tim mentioned only for new water heaters or can it be done on older heaters? Oh, I'm trying to remember. I, I looked mainly at the electric appliance rebates, not the gas appliance, but I think they have a rebate for high efficiency gas water heater, high efficiency electric water heater. Um, I don't know if it has to be a tank or if it could be instantaneous. So I thoroughly see tanks as the way to go for the sake of the grid, but. Um, but nothing for, new, for older water heaters, you uh, actually have to replace no, them. No, no. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, it, 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 they're only for purchasing a new, uh, a new appliance. All right, Marty, who does the energy audits? Um, yeah, that's, that, that's. CCE, um, I forgot, it's, uh, what does that stand for? Center for Energy and, and the Environment, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's other organizations. We we happen to use our insulation company, which is Penguin Insulation. But there's a lot of them out there. Um, there's other private companies that we will sometimes hire to audit houses. Um, so, I I just don't have anybody in particular that I definitely recommend. Um, if you look up on Excel's website, they will steer to the the Excel Home Energy Squad, and that yeah. squad is actually run by the Minnesota Center for uh, energy and environment, which you mentioned. <clears throat> Great. Um, this might be for Marty also. To learn about HVAC updates, or mm -hmm. Tim, do you need, or any of you, do you need to hire an electrician, or does Excel advise on this? Yeah. yeah. You need to hire a licensed HVAC contractor. So if it's your furnace, then it's uh, you know somebody who does um, furnaces. If it's a if it's a boiler, there are some companies that do both, and some companies that just specialize in, in hot water. Uh, but yeah, they have. You want to hire somebody who's licensed. Um, and the uh, the mechanical contractor doing the heating system will do the wiring necessary for that they'll have their own electrician or arrange yeah. for that. Yeah. Or you may need to upgrade your panel, in which case you need an electrician. Right. Or you might want to hire a general contractor that can yeah. coordinate the mechanical and the electrical. <laughs> what a nice yeah. plug. Yeah. All right, so, so this is a question that follows, because I think we have time for this. This will be our last question. Uh, is there a contractor who will come into a home and provide recommendations on converting appliances um, advise on upgrade and advise on upgrading a panel and advise on electrical code for water heaters, et cetera. So who's the right person to reach out to kind of help you develop that plan, that kind of planning? I don't know that this is an answer, but I had three gas appliances that needed to be replaced. My gas stove, my gas, um, uh, dryer and my gas water heater. And I, worked with, actually I worked with um, Warner Stellion, now has a plumbing department. They got rid of my gas, the gas lines to those fixtures. They helped me seal up the walls and they replaced the fixtures. I did have to hire a separate electrician, um, but I don't know, because I work commercially, I'm in the same boat you guys are in because I don't know who does residential contracting. And that's where we talked to Marty. Yeah. I, I can tell you, I just had an energy audit Oh, yeah. They did the, the, all the pictures and everything, mm -hmm. and they actually assigned somebody 
to help you go through your audit and choose the appliances and stuff like that? So for those online, she just said that Energy Audit was uh, who she used as CCE. CCE, okay. Do you have any, you want to add anything, Marjorie? I, I don't, I mean, $60 is a great deal. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. the way to go. And then, and then they work with you to do the actual installation. Right, so it goes from the audit to the, their discussion with you and then to the contractors. It sounds like that's yeah. the process, yeah. Okay, so you probably got a, a, a printout of the areas that they're recommending that they saw during the blower door test and like a, a written narrative in addition to probably some photographs exactly. and then uh, that would get handed to either the insulation contractor um, or, a, or a general contractor or whoever you would hire to do those improvements. I think that's a great place uh, to wrap up. So if you can join me in thanking our panelists for being here tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys. Yeah. And you. I'd also again like to um, recognize um, Elisa Lee and our friends from the St. Paul uh, Neighborhood Network, and they will edit this recording and it will be available soon uh, on our website. So thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, please uh, stay tuned for more information coming from SAPLA about all our great activities and, and programs and head over to Nico's. We'll see you there.